<clears throat> Good afternoon, Mrs. Mott. My name is Arlene Robinson. I was born in Fort Worth, Texas. My parents are Willie Hall Robinson, Jr. and Tominelle Magdade Robinson. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> where did you go to school? I, my first experience with school was in 1952 when my parents decided to move to the Pflugerville area and I attended the colored school in Pflugerville which was located in the colored edition of Pflugerville. How many uh, students were in your class about? That was a two-room school and I think at that time it was divided a uh, one room was for the elementary kids and the other room was for the kids I guess junior and senior high at that time. And do you remember your teacher that one year? Uh, yes I do. Uh, her name at the time was Mrs. Rosie Lee Lewis and uh, she's a teacher that has always held a special place in my heart. Uh, she was from Caldwell, Texas and at the time that she taught here she uh, roomed with my cousins, Albert and Lula Magdade. And it was in the, I think the late 90s that she passed away. She had, when she left here, she got jobs teaching in Austin. And when she passed away in the 1990s, I was able to go to her visitation. And her, she had, you know, married, had kids, and they really didn't know any of the students from Pflugerville, even though they knew she had taught here. And my older sister and I went, and I got up and spoke at her visitation, and the daughter was really pleased because she said, I was just hoping someone from Pflugerville, you know, where my mother started, would come here and speak, or just be here. And uh, that meant a lot. So, um, <coughs> uh, did you have to bring your lunch to school? Or tell us about what a, a normal school day would be like. A normal school day was the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yes, we did have to bring our lunches. Sometimes we took our lunch from home, and then sometimes when my mother didn't fix a lunch, my daddy would go somewhere, and at lunchtime he would come over with a hamburger for each of us. Okay. Yeah. And did you have a, a, a very large playground outside? I can't remember the playground. I know we went outside to play, but being a six-year-old, in a new place, getting to know all new people was, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit much. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, uh, ancestors, uh, the McDade family and <coughs> the Feimsters. I will start with the Feimster Robinson family since they were the first ones to arrive in Pflugerville. My great-great-grandfather, John Feimster, and his wife, Queen Esther Rubottom Feimster, were the first blacks to settle in Pflugerville. My uh, great-great-grandfather bought 100 acres of land out off of what is now called Heatherwild Heather Boulevard, which is west of Pflugerville. And uh, he came here, he and his wife, with their four young adult children. Uh, their second oldest daughter, Mary Jane, became my paternal great-grandmother. She was the father of my grandfather. Her son, Willie Robinson, whom my father was named for, was my grandfather. And he passed away before my father married my mother. Um, so the family farm was there. What did, uh, what did they raise crops on the farm? Or, or what, what did they actually uh, have animals? I've been told that they raised crops. They had animals, of course. In fact, from what I've been told, to survive, they had to, you know, farm and just have cows, chickens, poultry, just whatever to survive. And also, I was told that my grandfather, great grandfather, loved horses, and he, you know, that was a hobby for him to breed horses. And his, as I said before, his daughter Mary Jane became my grandmother. She married a preacher, Charles Robinson, and when they married, her father. My great-grandfather, John Feimster, gave them 25 acres of land, and they built a home, and they both lived there until their deaths. Uh, in the early days, uh, occasionally they had uh, family uh, cemetery plots on the farm. 
Uh, and I'm, I think that recently with the growth of Pflugerville that there was one that was discovered near the farm or on the farm. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I've always known that my great-great-grandparents were buried there. It was part of their land at the time, and I guess now it's still part of their land because they're buried there, and it's land that can't be sold because it is a cemetery. But my great-great-grandfather, John Feimster, his wife, Queen Esther, Rubottom Feimster, and their grandbaby are buried there. And is that now a preserved area, uh, or it, it's protected? It's there. Okay. Uh, one of my cousins who's deceased started the process of getting it um, zone historic, but the ball has kind of been dropped, you know, and I've been working with some people on that, but nothing has been done yet to get it, you know, historic. <clears throat> Okay, the MacDate family, when did they come to Pflugerville or what, where did they live in Pflugerville? The MacDate family, <coughs> excuse me, were in Pflugerville in the late 1800s. My great-grandfather, Peter MacDate, lived in the colored edition. His wife was Harriet Lane and their son, Albert MacDate, was my grandfather, my mother's father. And. Um, Albert actually uh, worked for the school for a while, didn't he? That was my grandfather's nephew. His name was Albert, too. Okay. <clears throat> the okay. one who worked for the school was my mother's first cousin. His father was Philip McDade, my grandfather's brother. And yes, uh, cousin Albert, as I called him, he worked for the school district. I think he was working there when I was a little girl uh, in what they called the primer. And uh, he was always bus driver custodian. He had, okay. um, and he worked for many years. He time. worked for many years because I think after integration, he was still working, you know, as a custodian for the school district. And you mentioned that the McDade family um, <coughs> frequently me. took in uh, teachers so that they would have a place to stay while they were uh, doing their duty. Yes, my cousin Albert and his wife Lula Burleson McDade, uh, they, it was just the two of them, no children, and they were kind enough to take in the young single teachers that were here with the women. Uh, we had a male uh, teacher, we called him Prof when I first came here and attended that school. His name was Mr. Jones and I guess he went back to Austin every day or wherever he lived. But, uh, what type <coughs> of work did um, did the MacDates do? Um, I know the railroad had come through Flutterville and of course it was a farm <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my father, di grandfather did work the railroad he uh, farmed for himself, and he worked for other farmers in the community. Okay, and uh, where, where was their farm located? Uh, the only place I've known my grandfather, Albert McDay, to live was right here at Walnut, uh, not Walnut, Wren, right here on the other side of uh, Flugel Hall, that street that runs okay. there, I think it's Wren. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But his father lived in the colored edition. Right. They, they lived actually close to the railroad track, didn't they? Yes, they did, right at the track, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So do you remember visiting their home when the train came through? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> in fact, when uh, we first came here in 1952, we briefly stayed with them a few months. And then from there, I think we moved in the, to the colored edition and lived in the Caldwell family home. My parents rented that before we moved to Austin. <coughs> My husband's family lived across the tracks, tracks to the mm -hmm. east, and they would frequently go and uh, pick dewberries. Do you remember um, dewberries along the railroad track? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, on my grandfather's property, I remember he had uh, fig trees and pecan trees. I love pecans. I don't care for figs, but that's what I remember because we were always told to, you know, stay on property, stay in the yard, you know, stuff like that. What uh, did y'all have any family traditions that you celebrated that you recall as a, as a, either as a young girl or even as you got older? Uh, yes, on my father's side, it was uh, the tradition. His aunts, Queen and Elizabeth they would always have Christmas Eve dinner for all the family. And we look forward to that every year because not only the good food, but they always had a lot of presents for everybody. 
So did they had a tree? They, they had a tree. And where uh, did the tree come from? Do you have any um, idea? I'm not sure, but they had a tree. I'm assuming they, you know, back in those days, people would go places and cut trees, bring them back, and uh, decorate them. And, uh, and uh, did you help decorate when you were a youngster? Not their tree, but at home with my family, we always decorated the tree. Any special decorations that you recall that you were partial to? Uh, no. What about special foods? What was a common food that you really uh, uh, had at special celebrations? Usually for Christmas and Thanksgiving, we would have a turkey dressing, yams, potato salad, greens, green beans. Easter, we would have maybe a leg of lamb, ham, potato salad, greens, green beans, salads. And uh, your father, Mr. Willie, was. Um, uh, he liked to come to downtown Pflugerville, and he visited some of the businesses. Do you remember him talking about uh, some of, of the store owners or, or who he went to purchase things from or uh, going to downtown? Yes, I do. Uh, my daddy, has he was always a people person. He loved people. And uh, I remember him shopping at Mr. J.B. Marshall's store. He used to uh, buy gas from Mr. Becker. Uh, and of course, he and Mr. Knable became very close. He used to uh, hang out with Mr. Whelan that lived right on the corner over here, um, downtown Pflugerville, right. and uh, help him, you know, work on cars and stuff. Uh, both of your parents lived to be uh, in their 90s or in late, their late 80s. They had a long life. Uh, yes, God bless both my parents with a long life. My mother was 87 when she passed away, and my dad was 94. Okay. And they uh, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary? Uh, they did in 1991, and, and that was... And you had a big celebration? Yes, we did. The celebration took place in Austin, though, but it was... Yeah. Uh, and family and friends, how, how, many, how, many, how many family, uh, just his family, how many people were in the family? When you say, in the, are you still, still speaking of the uh, anniversary or just his family? Uh, well, his let's go both. How many siblings <coughs> did he have? And then when you had the celebration, you know, um, by the time you count all of the children and grandchildren and maybe even great-grandchildren. Okay. Um, my father had one sister who was from my grandfather's first marriage. He was the oldest child from his second marriage to my grandmother and he had three brothers younger than him, so that's a total of five. I'm sorry, I missed one. <laughs> he had an older brother from my grandmother's uh, first marriage. There was, when my grandparents married, they each had a child, then they had my father and three other sons. And at the time of my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, uh, I'm Two of his siblings, two of his brothers that he grew up with, they had already passed. His sister lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She was not here. And his brother that was right under him, Carl, he was out of state, so he wasn't here. But all the kids, spouses and grandkids were there, and some of their long-term friends. Uh, you were baptized in Pflugerville? I was baptized in Pflugerville. At Gilliland Creek, when my family uh, first came to Pflugerville, we attended the St. Matthew Baptist Church, where my grandfather was a deacon. And uh, back in those days, church was an all-day event. You went to Sunday school, uh, morning worship, you went home, had lunch, came back to the evening and nighttime services, just an all-day thing. Yes, I, I remember being baptized in Gilliland Creek. So do you remember who the pastor was that uh, when you were baptized? At St. Matthew? No, I don't remember. Okay. Okay. And uh, so if church was all day, was there a lot of singing and just uh, general fellowship? It was general fellowship in those days. That's just what you did on Sundays. You worked hard all week on Sundays. You got dressed for church. And it was really nothing else to do around here in those days but go to church or just stay at home with family. Who 
were some of the other families that attended um, church back in those early days? At St. Matthew, because I was so young, I can't accurately tell you beside my grandfather and I want to say the Russells may have been there, but I can't say that with all accuracy. But when you speak of families in Flugerville that I know, I've known these people all my life from the time I was six years old and came here. Uh, the Russells, the Caldwells, uh, I think it was a couple called named the Smiths who lived in the Black Edition. I vaguely remember them. My cousin Albert, cousin Lula, the Allens, those people I remember. But at that particular time in my life, I can't say how many were at St. Matthew and how many were at St. Mary. Uh, my mother's family attended St. Matthew with the family, the Robinsons. Uh, they were always members of St. Mary. And my uncle James Albert Robinson, he was an associate minister up there. Uh, my aunts, uh, his wife and his sister, they were choir members, participated in the Missionary Society, Sunday school, just whatever, you know. So St. Mary's kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, ha has had a hundred years, of, and now St. Matthew's is no longer. St. Matthew's is no longer. I think the membership was so few, and to my grandfather and the others who were there decided to unite with uh, St. Mary. When I came back to Flugville, um, I joined St. Mary. I was a member of St. Mary, I guess, from the late 70s until 1994. And I decided to move my membership back to the church in Austin where I attended. There was an era in my life, and of course I, I attended um, several funerals at St. Mary's when mm -hmm. uh, women wore very stylish hats and I uh, I remember Miss Russell particularly and, and some of the other ladies just mm -hmm. gorgeous hats uh, mm -hmm. can you where where did they find these hats uh, where did you go shopping where they went shopping for those hats uh, I can't really say but uh, a lot of stores like JC Penney Sears they they had hats then I'm not really a hat person, and but when I have decided to go look for one, they're kind of hard to find. I wanted to wear a hat to my father's funeral, which I did. I was able to find it at Dillard's. But uh, you know, my mother wore hats, and I think she got some of hers at J.C. Penney's or Sears, you know. But uh, um, so what did uh, what did Miss Russell do? She was a mother, <coughs> a homemaker. Uh, and she also had longevity. She lived to be uh, over 100 years old, I think, or, or right at 100. Miss Russell was a very beautiful person. She raised a fine family. Uh, she was primary a homemaker. She was a reserved person, very sweet, you know. One of those older ladies that you can just get so much wisdom and understanding from. So did they have, uh, at their home, they had uh, uh, gardens and they had, uh, in the early days, I guess they had water or wells that they, uh, was their water supply? Most families had uh, gardens and they did have wells. I remember wells in our family. Uh, my grandfather had a well, which I was afraid to go near because I didn't want to fall in, <laughs> and my, uh, his sister, um, Mrs. Vicey Jones, who lived right at Wren and Pecan Street, she had a well. And everybody just had a well. I mm -hmm. think out on the uh, Robinson Feimster property, there were wells. Mm -hmm. you know, but I've always been afraid of wells. <laughs> did, uh, did you know any uh, of the people in the community who may have worked on the railroad and, and, and what their job was? The railroad was here for a period of time, and then in the 70s, it actually, you know, went away. When um, I think back, as I said before, I think most of the elderly men did work at the railroad in some capacity. Uh, during the late 60s, Mr. Carruthers, uh, he worked for the railroad. He, in fact, he was killed 
a few days before he retired, but I, he was working out of town, but he still lived here in Pflugerville. So he was over on Walnut. the railroad when he had an accident? Yes, and, and, and died, yes. Okay. But what now, did his, the Carruthers live uh, uh, near the McDates down in that area, or did uh, they live uh, <coughs> over by the Isaacs? Uh, that, that they lived near the Isaacs. Uh, okay. Well, my cousin McDates were there. It was my cousin McDay, the Isaacs, and the Carruthers, the Burroughs, and the Wheelers. For sure, I know they lived all on that same street. Uh, I know that there was a Mr. Lively, and uh, that I guess was like a section foreman, but then the people, you know, they would have those little cars that they would uh, go on the railroad to check and to fix the, uh, the, the rails. The railroad came right by the cotton gin, which, you know, that was a predominant uh, feature in the community with all of the cotton fields. Did, did any of the folks that you talked about work at the gin or have any uh, connection to the cotton uh, industry? I can't say accurately that any of them worked at the gin, but uh, all the people that I know growing up in Pflugerville and just being here pick cotton. I've even picked cotton. I was still picking cotton when I was in high school in the 60s. So It was before the, everything was mechanized. Right. They took our jobs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that would be mostly during the summertime or even during school time after school? In the, we, we would pick in the summer. Our parents never worked us. We couldn't work during school because to them getting our education was very important. But I do have some cousins, and I think even with my mother, when they were growing up, sometimes they would start school late because they knew the Negro children were somewhere picking cotton. If they weren't picking here, they went to Arizona, New Mexico. I have cousins of my generation who went away to Arizona and New Mexico to pick cotton. And some of them even attended school, you know, during that time in those places. Um, and I picked cotton too, mm -hmm. so that's why I, I'm asking. There were times when we didn't even wear shoes to the cotton field, mm -hmm. or we had to have uh, nearly like knee pads because mm -hmm. it, your knees would get so sore because you nearly crawled. Right. And you would pull that heavy uh, sack made out of muslin, I guess, yeah. uh, that uh, was cotton, heavy, thick cotton. Right. Uh, and and then you were so glad to get to the scale and weigh the cotton right. and mark the little, how many pounds down in the book. Right. Now, how did you get paid? Uh, did did your, your father or an older person <coughs> get the money and then give it to you, or did the farmer actually pay you directly? Uh, the money was given to the parents, and as you were speaking, I was, you know, reminiscing about the cotton sacks and all that, and I remember my grandfather, because we would all be out there together sometime and see my grandpa had the longest sack in the world and it didn't take him long to fill it up, you know. He was just good at picking cotton, you know. Well, and the sacks came in different lengths. When they you were a child, you had one appropriate, and then as you got older, you got a longer sack, and you're right, the men had very long, long sacks, sacks that they, yeah. could, uh, mm -hmm. they could pull. And then it was just a tripod mm -hmm. that they would have to get that sack off the ground so they could actually mm -hmm. weigh. Mm -hmm. And um, you got on the back, now they don't want people to ride on the back of the truck. Right. But, uh, you know, we would, uh, that's how we would go out to the fields mm -hmm. is uh, standing up or sitting in mm -hmm. the back of those trucks. I can't remember that we rode in a truck to get to the field. I think we were just driven there in the car and we just, you know, Grandpa was probably the first one there and the rest of us came and we picked cotton. I do remember the lunch breaks that we would take. You know, we'd have our sardines, crackers, pork and beans, stuff that you could take to the field. And uh, Yeah, do you remember if you wore gloves? Because you could pull the cotton out and then sometimes they would just pick the whole burr, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was two different ways, but that that burr could start uh, cutting your hands. Uh, I remember the elderly, the older people using gloves, but the children, we were there 
just to be there, we weren't good cotton pickers, even though we were there to help, and we just didn't know the art they of... They needed to be there, and so they couldn't leave you with a babysitter, and you were there to... No, we were there with good intentions, but we just weren't experienced in picking cotton like they had been yeah. picking all their lives, you know. Yeah. We did the best we could, but I can't remember wearing gloves, you know. Okay. And you would look for shade any place to get a water break, sometimes under a truck or a trailer to just That's get right. relief from that hot temperature. That's stuff. true, because no, no trees in the cotton patch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, um, you had some members of your family that then uh, went to Pflugerville High School after it was integrated. Uh, can you tell about some of their experiences <coughs> in that time period? Uh, yes, uh, I think in 1964 when the schools were integrated, the five children under me, starting with my sister Linda, they all attended uh, the integrated school. And relationships were strained, and I think that has a lot to do with people just not being familiar with each other. Uh, but. Uh, my parents, our parents, always taught us to, you know, try to get along with people, be respectful, uh, be honest, loyal, just be good citizens. And I think that's what uh, carried them. Uh, from some of the stories they would tell me, you know, a lot of other children got frustrated and dropped out of school. but. In my family, education has always been, you know, something my parents always encouraged us to get because they didn't. And life is hard without an education. And, uh, but things worked out and soon they assimilated and got involved. My brother's Jimmy, he was a second graduate. Uh, he, my brother, James and Joseph, they played football, ran track. Um, the girls, I don't think they participated in any extracurricular activities, at least they never spoke of it. But as far as just relationships, going to school, you know, they made friends. In fact, Linda was here several years ago to her class reunion. You know, I think she went to somebody's place in Georgetown and she enjoyed that seeing everybody. And a few years ago, they had a reunion. Uh, here at uh, the Lions Hall or something. It was, it was and, the uh, Lions Hall, and I remember they were, it was really a nice time. And I even went, <laughs> you know, I, I, and I enjoyed it, you know, seeing everybody. And t they took pictures with the superintendent at the time, Mr. Uh, Dupree, and all. And just to sum it up, I think they adjusted well to integration, mm -hmm. and they have fond memories of attending school here. I have a son, Pflugerville School, the integrated school is all he knows, and uh, he excelled at football track. He represented Pflugerville at Boys State one year. His senior year, he was voted uh, Mr. PHS, which back when they were coming along, that probably would never would have happened, you know. So things have gotten better, you know. Yeah, well, what, what year was that? Uh, when did he graduate? My son graduated in 1991. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, Linda and uh, a, a few of your siblings went to the University of Texas, right? Uh, yes. Uh, my brother Joseph, my brother James, these are the two youngest brothers. Uh, they graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. My brother Jimmy, he was the second uh, Negro to graduate from Pflugerville High School. He graduated from the University of Texas at San Antonio. And they were the first in the family to uh, graduate from college? Uh, they were the first in the family to graduate from college, but I was the first to attend college. Okay. I think. And where did you go to school? Uh, when I graduated high school, I went to Prairie View A&M, but I didn't finish. I dropped out. And when I decided to go back to school, I started back at ACC, and I went to the University of Texas and graduated. So uh, that was... Uh, even today, it's very expensive to go to college. Uh, <coughs> how did how did your mom and dad uh, fund the college uh, uh, for y'all to go? Uh, some went 
with my dad's veterans benefits along with working, when I went, I uh, used my company's tuition plan and, you know, back then tuition was cheap compared to today, so that's how we went. No one ever took out a student loan. When my son went to college, he wanted to go away, but I knew that it was cheaper to stay at home, so we fought back and forth and finally I convinced him to go at home and he graduated college, you know, from the University of Texas without any student loans. What is his career now? My son's an accountant. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, so uh, let's uh, talk about, uh, you came back and lived in Pflugerville, and you, so you've seen Pflugerville change uh, uh, over the last couple of decades. It, it became an actual city in 1965. Right. So what, what have you noticed as some of the changes since you came back? I've noticed a lot of the changes. Uh, when I was a teenager, when my parents moved here, I could not see moving to this place. It was nothing here. <laughs> the, you know, in, in addition to wanting to stay and finish from my high school, I just felt like at that time, Pflugerville had nothing to offer me. And since I've been living here as an adult, and before my daddy passed away, he used to always bring that up, you know, saying how when they first came here, he couldn't get me here, but now I don't want to leave, you know, and I really don't want to leave. I've seen just so much, so much change for the better in Pflugerville. It's an ideal place to live, and I just continue to see, I just continue to see Pflugerville getting better and better, you know. There's more places to shop. More places to shop. We even have a library that we didn't have back in the day. And in fact, I remember it was around 1980 or 81, I was doing my uh, social work internship at the North Road Community Center when it was in the, the shopping center, Walnut, whatever this is right here on the corner. And uh, Mrs. Whiteley and a couple others decided to organize a library, you know. So yes, Pflugerville is, is really grown, and uh, it's a beautiful place to live, you know, a very beautiful place to live. Uh, St. Mary's also uh, built a new sanctuary and enlarged their facility, and I assume that again was due to, uh, to the growth and of course the age of the other sanctuary. Uh, that and uh, even prior to the new church being built, uh, with the older church, we are, and I was a member then, we always had to desire to build another church, but we didn't have the congregation or the resources to take on such a task like that. And now with the growth of Pflugerville, so many uh, people have moved here, different demographics and professionals, and even with uh, the leadership, of Reverend Coxum, I, I really admire him. He's a strong leader, and uh, I give him credit for encouraging the people, you know, to build a new sanctuary. Are there any other leaders or characters? I know Pastor Coxum has been here, what, nearly 20 years or so? Uh, I'm not sure of how many years, but he has, he has certainly made a difference. Yes, he became pastor of St. Mary, uh, the fall of the winter of 1994, okay. and um, well, that's 30 years nearly. Just about 20, uh, yeah. 30 years, yeah. Yeah. So, that's so he's uh, he's, he's nurtured great. many families through uh, good and bad times. Yes, he has. Yeah, yes, true. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's pause for a minute, Wade. And, um, so tell us a little bit about uh, your grandmothers. Uh, did, did they do any sewing or cooking of special recipes that you can recall? In my lifetime, I, my father, I never knew my mother's mother. She passed away when my mother was a small child. Uh, my father's mother, who never lived here, uh, I knew her when I was a child living in Fort Worth. She remarried, moved to California for years, and I never, saw her again until I was in my late teens, <clears throat> excuse me. But we did have seamstress in our family and good cooks that I grew up around, and that was my Aunt Frances Elizabeth, who grew, here, grew up here in Pflugerville. Mary Jane and Charles Robinson were her parents. 
and uh, her sister, Queen Esther. They were good cooks, excellent seamstress. They would just make us clothes. They looked like they went to Sears or J.C. Penney's and bought, and they enjoyed sewing. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Miss Caldwell, there's a school named after Miss Caldwell. I believe she was a teacher at one time, but uh, any, any memories of the Caldwell family? I have a lot of memories of the Caldwell families because they're one of the black families that have had roots in Pflugerville for a long time. Um, I was told that Miss Caldwell was a teacher. I, my relationship was with Miss Caldwell is primarily uh, from church. She uh, was a sweet woman, a very intelligent woman. Uh, I would say most of the church etiquette that I know came from Miss Caldwell. Uh, Miss Russell, Miss Caldwell, those ladies, they taught us, you know, they taught us well, you know. And uh, she raised a fine family. She had 10 kids or more, and she was a wonderful grandmother, well-respected woman. And I think up until her death, she was just still trying to be active and involved. I remember going to her I think it was the 103rd birthday party or something they gave her, and she still, you know, had good memory and everything. Even though she was blind, she was just very involved. And in her later years? Yes, she was, mm -hmm. she was. But she was still able to function? Yes, she, she was still able to she function. She had someone helping her? Uh, Ms. Carr, well, like I say, she raised uh, a beautiful family, and it's one thing that I've told the Caldwell girls women and the Russell women. Their mother, of course, were almost old enough to be my mother's mother. But you go through life and you observe how other people behave. And I've told those, the Caldwell sisters and the Russell sisters that, you know, I watched y'all. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Excuse me. I learned from those ladies how to take care of my parents. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate them, you know, being an example for me. That's right. And it's, uh, it's like your uh, whole family, really, together. Right, yeah. 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 So what did, uh, when y'all were kids, uh, or even your brothers and sisters, <coughs> what kind of games did you, uh, or what did they do for fun? Uh, other than, uh, there wasn't a lot of time, I guess, for fun, but... Uh, were there activities, or did they, um, there wasn't much to do in Pflugerville, as you said. Well, uh, me being a child and playing, I was in Austin, and most of them were there with me, but what we did as a family, I think it spilled over out here too, we uh, played jacks, we jumped rope, we played Chinese checkers, we did the hula hoop, uh, volleyball, Badminton, you know, we just did a lot of different activities. Yeah, okay. I, I never was good with skating, but a lot of, the, you know, a lot of them skated. And teenage boys would always have some kind of pranks that they would get involved in um, at school, and and um, I'm not sure that uh, that you were aware of any of, uh, um, for instance, at Halloween, some of the the boys in my class they did some crazy things, and uh, it was just kind of typical back in those days, whether they would, um, you know, ride on the roof or okay. you know, that kind of thing. Out here, uh, my parents didn't allow us out on Halloween unless it was something going on at the church. Sometimes the church would have uh, parties for the children, but just going out like we allow our kids now to trick or treat and all that, we couldn't do that. You know. That's very good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, we, you have a very rich heritage, and it's part of Pflugerville, and um, it's uh, it's it's really good to have fine folks like your mom and dad and their families that have been contributing families to this community. And thank you for asking me.